Good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We are doing an online meetup after months, so thanks a lot again for showing your support for the Java user group at Bangalore. Uh, we are excited to host TypeSense uh, team today. That is Jason and uh, Kishore. Uh, TypeSense is something quite interesting for uh, applications looking to use open source alternatives for search. I will let Jason walk us through what TypeSense is uh, without much more ado. Over to you, Jason. Great, thanks, Shavik. Hey, everyone, nice to meet you all. Uh, so uh, I want to talk to you about uh, TypeSense today. So if you've heard of any of these names that I've put on the first slide, uh, you know, Alcolia or Pinecone or Elasticsearch, so TypeSense is essentially an open source alternative to each of these. and you can self-host it for free. We also have a cloud version as well, if you want it, uh, uh, where we run the infrastructure for you. Uh, but that's TypeSense in a nutshell, and, and I'm going to talk about why TypeSense, what use cases, what you know, how it came to be, uh, and how we you know differentiate from all the other products in the market uh, today for specifically uh, site and app search. So. Um, <clears throat> So quick background about myself. Uh, so I'm one of the co-founders. I'm based out of Houston uh, in the US. Uh, uh, before type, working on TypeSense, I was uh, head of engineering at a company called Verishop before, in the e-commerce space. And then before that, I was at Dollar Shape Club, uh, which is, was also in the e-commerce space, uh, uh, more on the subscription e-commerce side. Uh, and then I was also at Block Beacon and Dun & Bradstreet uh, as well, which was in the FinTech uh, uh, in tech space. And then I also have uh, Kishore, uh, my co-founder as well. So Kishore, he worked at Zapier uh, before this as an SRE. Uh, and then he was at Index uh, as well, which is a, 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 a startup uh, specializing in like e-commerce like price comparison. Uh, and then before that, he also used to work at uh, ThoughtWorks as well. Uh, oh, and Kishore is based out of Chennai. Uh, so Kishore and I, we met actually when so I grew up in Chennai and, and we met in undergrad. Uh, and that's how we've been working on many, many things together, uh, TypeSense being one of them. And then uh, TypeSense is the one that you know we decided to go full-time on across all the other projects that we worked on uh, together. Uh, cool. So real quick, uh, my animations are messed up. I just noticed. Okay. Uh, so real quick. So in a nutshell, so TypeSense is a typo tolerant search engine. So anything to do with fuzzy search uh, is built into the engine without much tweaking. And it is an in-memory search engine. So that's one big difference uh, between, for example, Elasticsearch, uh, where we've decided when we started, so we started working on TypeSense in 2015. And one of the bets we took was that RAM is only going to get cheaper as we go along. Uh, and it has held true for the most part. Uh, and it only continues to go down uh, uh, year over year from what we've seen. So we decided let's just put everything in memory and optimize all of our data structures for fast in-memory search rather than trying to straddle a world of, you know, on disk versus a little bit of uh, uh, RAM cache, which is what the other search engines tend to do. Uh, and it's built in uh, C++. And things that we optimize for are speed. Like I said, it's an in-memory search engine. So we optimize for what we call search as you type experiences where every key press starts returning results right away. Uh, and another important thing is we prioritize developer happiness. And I'll go into detail into what that means, but essentially we want it to be easy to integrate with, easy to run in production, and everything hopefully is intuitive. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what defaults to set, the structure of the API so that everything makes sense without you having to spend too much time, you know, going through the uh, going through the documentation. So that's in general our uh, philosophy. So uh, in terms of uh, metrics, so we have about thirteen point six stars on uh, GitHub, uh, and we have about Docker uh, six million Docker pulls. And just earlier this week, uh, we reached about one billion uh, searches per month on TypeSense Cloud. Uh, and just four months ago, we were at about 500 million uh, searches per month. And so in about four months, we, we were able to double it. And it's continuing to accelerate uh, now on TypeSense Cloud. On the open source version, which people self-host, we do not have any analytics by design. 
so we actually do not know how many more searches people uh, you know people already do uh, with the existing self-hosted uh, users. Um, so zooming in a little bit. So here's what we mean by speed and you know uh, performance. So we aim for sub 50 millisecond results with millions of records. So of course the performance is a function of the number of records, the you know the size of the size of each record, the complexity of the query that you run. But in general, I would say sub 50 milliseconds with full text search with millions of records is what we. Uh, what we aim for, and I'll show you a couple of demos of this. Um, and by developer productivity, like I said, we mean defaults for everything. We spend a lot of time going back and forth on uh, uh, what a good default is, uh, because there are so many use cases, we can't satisfy all of them, but then we try to pick something that just works for maybe let's say 80% of the use cases, and then provide knobs for folks to tweak the, you know, the remaining 20%. Uh, and it's a RESTful API, so it's JSON-based, uh, everything uh, has, uh, 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 you know, your standard HTTP verbs. Uh, so it should feel very familiar to any of the other, you know, maybe let's say even SaaS APIs that you integrate with. And if you look at an API uh, payload and you look at the API URL, hopefully it should make intuitive sense again without having to uh, uh, pour through the documentation. So that's something that we optimize for. Uh, and then low operational overhead. So we want you to be able to run type sense without having to worry about things like uh, you know any runtime uh, dependencies uh, you know how do i scale multiple components like in type sense everything is a single binary and it scales out of the box so you don't have to worry about additional uh, uh, components you just install the you know whatever package for your operating system and it just works it gives you a http endpoint to start sending data and send search requests uh, uh, to uh, mention this, and then uh, we also, in terms of fault tolerance, so we use a raft-based clustering mechanism. So uh, you can provision multiple nodes, and again, even with clustering, it's as easy as just running the same binary on multiple uh, uh, instances, uh, uh, machines, and then just pointing each other's to each other's IP addresses, and then TypeSense takes care of automatically replicating the data. Uh, to all of the nodes. So, and one important thing is that we support, uh, uh, we replicate the entire copy of the data set uh, and do not do partial like shard based uh, uh, replication at the, at the moment. Um, and what this allows you to do is also geo distribution. So you could, for example, provision nodes across different data centers. And it's, we've also optimized things for cross region replication, even across relatively high latency uh, uh, links you know, between regions as well. Uh, and like I mentioned, it scales out of the box. You know, you probably have to, you know, maybe tweak, uh, you know, at, I don't know, thousands of requests per second, you probably have to tweak your TCP settings on your OS. But besides that, within TypeSense, you don't have to tweak anything. It just makes use of the number of cores that you give it. It'll take advantage of all of that and scale out to, uh, 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 you know, thousands of requests per second, if not more. Uh, so here's what we mean by developer happiness. So uh, we have a built-in HTTP server. So this is the same server. It's, it's called H2O. Uh, this is what Fastly, for example, uses in production to run all the on all their edge servers. Uh, so it's been battle tested, and that's something that we have built into TypeSense. So you don't have to, for example, deploy another reverse proxy in front of TypeSense or uh, or, or any. You know, you do, you can even expose TypeSense directly to your uh, browser or your app and send search requests directly from your uh, from the client side into TypeSense. So that's an important thing. Uh, you know, for example, something like Elasticsearch, typically people don't expose it directly to client-facing traffic. Here at TypeSense, we've designed a lot of the things to make sure that it can be directly exposed to uh, client-side traffic. Now, that doesn't mean that it's only useful for public search. We do have a built-in mechanism for authentication that you know you can uh, act, limit access to records or documents or uh, or even fields within every record you can control granularity uh, access granularity at that level of detail um, and that also means that you can store multiple uh, tenants data on your site in one uh, 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 index and then selectively have different API keys that can only access subsets of the data which is useful for example if you have logged in users and 
if only login users can access just their own data, you can do that uh, out of the box with, uh, with TypeSense. And then in uh, grouping and distinct, so typically in e-commerce, for example, if you have, uh, you know, uh, for example, shirts in multiple colors and you don't want to show all uh, multiple, uh, uh, maybe not colors, let's say multiple sizes, and each of these are individual SKUs, but you don't want to display all of these SKUs, similar looking products in, in, in a single code. We've designed for that as well. So you group by uh, the variant name, in this case, let's say the size, and then it'll shrink all of that into one uh, result per group. Uh, so you don't have to do any client-side uh, manipulation for this. So here, having said all of that, so here are a couple of uh, use cases uh, for how you can use uh, types. And so the primary use case uh, is, like I was saying, search as you type. So let me show you what that exactly means here. Uh, so this is a, uh, a songs data set. So I took this data set from uh, this open database called Music Brains uh, and indexed okay. it in TypeSense. I think there are some questions. So we just want to understand. Shall we shoot out oh, the yep. question there in the slide or we need to wait till then? That's a uh, I, can, I can go either way. We can, we can start uh, right away as well. That's it. Jason, it that your preference. Uh, probably you can uh, take these questions in between uh, between a take a 10 minute break or five minute break later when you feel like because it will otherwise disturb the flow. Okay, yeah, sorry, fair one, enough. <laughs> one question about RAM here, uh, which seems interesting. For example, Sagar has asked, should I say it provides high availability, but not scalability? In this case, I can't utilize other resources available in the cluster to handle larger volumes of data. So his question uh, is more about how do you handle high availability? So essentially, it's a, it's essentially a distributed cluster, meaning that you can send the data to any of the nodes and it will automatically replicate it to all the other nodes. And then you can distribute your search traffic to any of the nodes. So write traffic, I mean, you can send the write traffic as well to any of the nodes, but then internally it'll forward it to the leader node at the current at that point in time. Uh, but I, I think if I get what you're saying, it's uh, it's you can use clustering, of course, for fault tolerance, so that even if one node goes down in a, in a, a raft-based cluster, the other two nodes will continue servicing reads and writes. Uh, but what it is not meant for is to scale your RAM availability because every node has to have the same amount of RAM because we replicate the entire data set. Where it helps with scalability, though, is to help increase read throughput. So you can essentially have all of the nodes uh, uh, process uh, reads in parallel. So you essentially, you know, uh, in a three node cluster, or you can spin up a five, five node cluster, you can mul uh, have a multiple of your read three throughput distributed across all of the, all of the nodes. Um, oh, so he's talking about data distribution in multiple servers rather than all servers having the right. So that, that's what I earlier meant by uh, sharding. So we don't shard subsets of the data across different nodes. Uh, what we instead we recommend that you do, uh, you know, maybe spin up multiple types and slices or today, you know, commercially available RAM is up to 24 terabytes you can put on a single machine. So that's one big reason that we haven't gone down the path of sharding across nodes because RAM today is already available at scale. Uh, like for example, on AWS, you can spin up 24 terabyte RAM machines today. So uh, the, uh, so what I, I should say, so that's that actually takes me to a good point, which is, so we're specifically not uh, aiming for uh, serving, let's say petabyte scale data. Like I would say Elasticsearch still does a great job of that. And it's also very cost effective if you put petabytes of data on disk. Where we're solving for is, I would say, a search for uh, websites, you know, websites that have a search bar or search bars inside you know, mobile apps. That's the use case that we want to solve for uh, with TypeSense. And typically in these use cases, you know, I've seen, you know, maybe like 500 million to a billion records, I would say, is at, and the, at the really high end for these particular use cases. Now, something like log search, for example, that can get to like multiple uh, you know, tens of terabytes of data. For that, you still want to use Elasticsearch. You, you know, you don't want to you, uh, put all of that in RAM because it's going to be, first of all, quite expensive compared to disk. And you typically don't need fast searches you type for, you know, log search type of uh, type of use cases. So, uh, so that's one reason today the type of scaling is uh, vertical scaling in terms of RAM capacity uh, and horizontal scaling is only for uh, reads. 
Uh, folks, there's a great documentation on TypeSense website. I'm posting some of the links which will help us understand what problems TypeSense is aiming to solve and what not, uh, as Jason is already highlighting. Please go through it. Probably that will give you more ideas on what TypeSense is and isn't at times. Awesome. Uh, cool. So let me walk you through the first use case. So this is your, uh, this is the, you know, one main use case for TypeSense is, you know, search as you type. So notice as I keep typing, uh, even with 32 million songs, it returned this result in about 19 milliseconds. Uh, so that is what I mean by search as you type. So because it's so fast, you're able to not have to, you know, type, 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 and then press enter, which is like the tr more traditional search experience. Uh, instead, you can start uh, building experiences where you show the search results right away. So that's what I mean by uh, search as you type. Um, <clears throat> so again, if you notice, as I keep using the different search terms, it's like 63 milliseconds, uh, even with 32 million songs. And then uh, I can apply filters right here uh, to get to drill down into the results that I need. Uh, and it also has faceting right here. So all the counts of what, uh, uh, how many records have this particular value. So faceting is there. And then you can search within uh, uh, within the facet values as well. Uh, yes, and fuzzy search as well is built in. So, you know, for example, if I uh, type, you know, Beethoven or something, uh, it still pulls up the right uh, uh, keyword right here. Uh, so, Fuzzy search works out of the box without you having to configure additional indices, et cetera. You can configure up to how many uh, 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 characters can be considered a typo. You can say if the string is less than four characters, then apply one typo. If the string is more than, you know, this other set of characters, apply two typo uh, uh, corrections. So it's pretty configurable as well. Um, so this is, this is one use case. So search is your type. And then you can filter to drill down into the results, uh, uh, and you know this uh, pagination, etc., uh, as well. So that's that's one use case. Um, and then the other one, the next one is a geo search uh, uh, experience. So, so this is a, a data set of about one million uh, Airbnb listings uh, around Los Angeles. So, uh, notice as I keep moving the map. These requests are actually geo search requests over to TypeSense, which says, "Get me all records with a lat long in this bounding box that's visible in the in the screen." So, uh, as I keep moving the map, we keep making additional requests to TypeSense to get these results. So, again, if you notice, even with one million listings, it's about sixteen milliseconds to get the uh, to get the data here. Uh, and then on top of that, I can start applying filters right here. Uh, you know, numeric filters. Uh, et cetera. And again, from TypeSense perspective, it's it's all uh, numeric filters uh, and then uh, uh, string filters as well. Uh, are these requests runtime? Uh, no, so this actually is the search time, not the request time. So this does, this excludes network latency because network latency is, you know, is, is a function of well, where you're running the service. Uh, but that said, in this particular case, at least in TypeSense Cloud, for example, we have this concept of, a, we call it a search delivery network. Essentially, you can spin up nodes across different regions, uh, and then whenever a request is made, it will make its way to the node that's closest to the user. Uh, so using that, you can reduce the network latency. It's kind of like a CDN, except that uh, in a CDN, only the most frequently used items are uh, stored on the edge servers. Uh, here in the in our search delivery network, we actually replicate the entire data set to each of the nodes. So when a request is made, that node can fully service all of the requests that sent to it instead of having to go back to uh, to an origin. Um, so speaking of, so one another interesting use case I uh, I don't have a visual demo to show for this is uh, given that you can uh, replicate across regions pretty easily. Uh, another use case for TypeSense I've seen some users do is because TypeSense can just accept JSON data and then you can query by a single ID as well. I've seen users use TypeSense as a distributed caching store, a geo-distributed caching store as well. So, you know, if you, you know, for example, think of an e-commerce site where 
in the product details page, you can actually fetch all of the details for a single product from TypeSense and use TypeSense to power that page as well without having to hit your uh, database. Okay, maybe you you know you fetch pricing information because it's real time uh, from your database, but all other you know factual information can be fetched directly from TypeSense. So you essentially save. Uh, you know, it's typically harder to replicate your you know primary relational database. Whereas if you if you're already storing a copy of your data inside of TypeSense, then you might as well use that as a as a caching uh, a store as well. Especially if you geo distribute it, then you can use it as a distributed cache store and reduce network latencies. Uh, uh, as well. Um, and then another uh, uh, use case is uh, what we call faceted navigation experiences. So I'm going to show you a live uh, site. This is a, this is one of our customers. This is Purvika uh, mobile phones. Uh, so they use TypeSense right here. You know, this is the traditional autocomplete uh, experience right here. Uh, and then now if I don't type anything and I directly go into one of the category pages, all of these products are also fetched from TypeSense. So I don't have, without even typing any search terms, I can directly start applying filters to drill down to the list of products uh, that I need. So in addition to full text search, this is what we call a navigation experience. So if you have a catalog of products or courses, uh, you can use TypeSense to power your browsing experience as well, in addition to search experiences with, uh, uh, the, the reason you would want to do this is to increase performance. So again, you, instead of having to hit your primary database, you can hit TypeSense and return the results quickly uh, instead of sending all these requests to, uh, uh, to a slower relational store. Um, <clears throat> so that's a faceted navigation experience and then uh, so this is one of our newer uh, use cases. So uh, uh, we support vector search in TypeSense. So what this means is that you can take the output of any of these machine learning models and take those you know, embeddings, which is the output of these machine learning models, put them inside of TypeSense, uh, and then do what we call a nearest neighbor search to get relevant results, uh, uh, to get some, uh, I should say, well, nearest neighbor results, I guess. Uh, so there are bunch of use cases for this. One is you can do semantic search. So what that means is, uh, you know, let's say if you have, uh, you know, a search term, like, uh, I don't know, you're, maybe in your data set, you have the search term called ocean, and maybe the user is searching for the word C. And though your search database doesn't have the word C in it, or a C in it, semantic search will be able to, depending on the model that you use, of course, semantic search will be able to get correlated results. Uh, even if your core data set does not have that uh, a keyword as well. So you can do that with vector search. You can also do similarity search, meaning that given this uh, record, get me all other records that are similar to this. And you know, you can, for example, in e-commerce, you can say, get me all products that are similar to this. Maybe in a content domain, you can say, hey, here's an article, get me all articles that are similar to this, uh, et cetera. And then you can also do recommendations with this. So you know, given this product, uh, get me all products to recommend to this user. And, you know, there are separate recommendation models uh, that you can use to generate the embeddings for that, which can take into account user profile history in the past, uh, you know, past purchases, et cetera. So regardless of what model you use, from TypeSense's perspective, it's essentially you take the output of these models, which are vectors, and put them in TypeSense, and then you can do nearest neighbor searches. And that also opens up an interesting use case, which is uh, integrations with large language models. Uh, like for example, if you wanted to have chat GPT, for example, use uh, data from your own data set to answer questions, one way you could do this is, uh, you know, essentially you're in the prompt to chat GPT, you would say, uh, you know, whatever the use, question the user types in, send that to chat GPT, and then also send that to TypeSense do a nearest neighbor search to get all related uh, uh, top three results maybe, put that in the prompt to chat GPT and say, try to answer this with your knowledge base. If not, use these uh, 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 top three results from the results are coming from TypeSense to answer these questions. So essentially that's that's how you get chat GPT to, to use your data uh, in a contextual way. So uh, if you've heard of LangChain, we've integrated with LangChain as well. So you can essentially use uh, 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 TypeSense as a backing store for uh, as essentially long-term memory. You want to think of it that way for uh, uh, for for ChatGPT or Barn, etc. Uh, let me show you one example uh, that I have a live example. 
so this is an like an e-commerce store that we have uh, as a demo store. Uh, so what we've essentially done is, so this find similar button uses type census vector search. Um, so this, for example, essentially it says, given this product ID, get me all products that are similar to that. And that uses the vector search feature. Uh, and all of these results are fetched from, uh, uh, from type census nearest neighbor search. So it, all of what I just mentioned sounds super complicated, but really it's, it's really 14 lines of code to generate these uh, 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 vectors. For example, that I'm using this pre-built model right here. Uh, 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 it's part of the sentence word family. Uh, and I'm essentially concatenating the product name, description, and categories into one string, sending it to the model, uh, and then embedding it, and then writing it back into a JSON file. And this is the JSON file that I import back uh, into, into TypeSense. Uh, and then here, I'm essentially saying, here's a product ID. Do a, get me all similar products. What TypeSense is doing internally is uh, it's going and fetching the vectors for that particular product's ID and then doing nearest neighbor search using those vectors to get all the uh, all the similar products. So in the uh, so so far what I showed you is generating embeddings outside of TypeSense. So you'd have to write something like this to generate these embeddings, or maybe use, for example, uh, you still have to write you know a script to maybe call OpenAI's embedding models or uh, you know the Palm Google's Palm API's embedding models to get uh, to generate these embeddings and then store them inside of TypeSense. In the upcoming version of TypeSense. We're actually adding the ability to generate embeddings from within uh, 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 TypeSense. So essentially, we've integrated with uh, OpenAI, Palm API. We are also going to ship with built-in SentenceBert and uh, uh, the E5 model as well uh, from Microsoft. So you can essentially say, given these fields, and here's the API key to use for OpenAI or Palm API, or use SentenceBert or uh, 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 E5, and then concatenate the values of these fields automatically and then put the embeddings inside of that. So all you have to do is send the JSON data as usual into TypeSense. Uh, and then TypeSense will automatically calculate the embeddings based on which fields you tell TypeSense to use to calculate these. And then that allows you to do semantic search built into TypeSense. So when you type in a keyword, TypeSense will automatically generate embeddings for that using the same model that was used to generate the embeddings for your uh, 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 for the JSON data, and then do a nearest neighbor search and then return results uh, uh, in a semantic way. So built-in semantic search is going to be super powerful. And on top of that, we're also adding the ability to combine keyword search along with semantic search and do a hybrid search and rank these results together. So you essentially get the best of both worlds because it's hard to beat keyword searches in like short for short keywords. So we will prioritize those keyword searches first, followed by uh, any semantically uh, related uh, uh, related uh, um, result, results as well. Um, <clears throat> cool. So that's vector search. It, it, I mean, it's this is like a big, I would say maybe a big can of worms. There's lots of things that you can achieve with uh, with vector search, and we're just scratching the surface uh, uh, in in what I just explained. I had a question. So yep. vector search is primarily driven by semantic search, right? As a search type. Uh, it's the other way around. I would say semantic search is driven by vector search. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is uh, vector search is the underlying thing that uses. So vectors are, think of it as just uh, a, a bunch of floating point numbers that represent the data in, a, in an alternate way. Uh, what semantic search essentially is, is you generate the vectors for the keyword that the user is typing in. And then instead of doing a keyword search, you're doing a nearest neighbor search for the vectors of the uh, query, and then you're comparing it with all the vectors that you already have in your existing data set and saying, what are the closest uh, 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 vectors for this query, essentially? Okay. Um, cool. So I see a question here. Are, are there any uh, companies currently using vector search with Titans and Prod? So, uh, yes, so we have, uh, I mean, of all the folks that we do have a direct uh, contact with, uh, in fact, this is how this actually started, the vector search uh, endeavor started, is uh, we have this one company that uses vector search for image similarity search, or whether which is just another big use case for vector search. Uh, essentially, they generate uh, uh, embeddings for all of the images that their users upload into their system, uh, and then they're able to do semantic image search 
instead of having to do you know uh, 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 object detection and storing all these tags as keywords and like that's one way of doing uh, uh, image search but here they're actually generating embeddings for the images and then do, doing a nearest neighbor search uh, based on the keywords that users are typing in to return visually similar uh, uh, images so that's uh, that's one use case I've seen uh, and now uh, a couple of users are trying, you know, I've seen, it seems like it's, it's becoming a common thing. We're trying to get chat GPT to use users' own data. I've seen, I'm starting to see various incarnations of these, uh, you know, of in different domains, uh, et cetera, uh, which is interesting to watch uh, uh, happen. But I would say, you know, the vector search, it, interestingly, has been around for a really long time. But now the the popularity of LLMs, uh, et cetera, is, uh, has definitely brought it up to the forefront. So I see a lot more activity now rather than when we launched vector search. For example, I think we started working on it maybe in uh, October of last year. Um, it was like a you know, we we thought we'd have to explain in detail what vectors are, embeddings are, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, but in the last several months, I mean, it seems like you know a lot of people know about LLMs and uh, vectors now. Cool. Uh, all right. So additional uh, examples. So federated search is an, is another example. So what federated search is given a search term, uh, you can search multiple indices and then show all of the results side by side. So one uh, one practical example of this is uh, is Arsenal. So this is one of our uh, customers. So on their site, if you type a search keyword right here, so they're searching across multiple types of content, so news and articles, video around the club uh, and players. Uh, and you know, if you notice, it's like search as you type, like everything is near instantaneous uh, uh, to get you the results. So. Uh, uh, Federate, this is what we call federated search. So other use cases for this would be in uh, in e-commerce again. For example, if you have, uh, maybe you wanna show uh, results from your products and then results from maybe uh, past historical search terms that users have typed and maybe results from brand keywords, et cetera. You can show all of them side by side uh, as well. Uh, and maybe let's say in a, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, an entertainment site, uh, let's say you you can search through TVs and and uh, uh, TV shows and movies. You can maybe show TV shows and movies side by side using the same uh, keyword that the user user types in. Uh, Twitter search. I'm not sure. Let's see. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, so they do have um, uh, like a, yeah. You can search for people. You can search for tweets. Uh, and I think if I remember like the events or something. Uh, so yeah, so that's actually an, another good example of federated search. Uh, uh, and that reminds me, so Code Academy, they also use TypeSense in a similar fashion uh, right here. So if I search for you know, JavaScript right here, so they do federated search. So they search across courses, articles, and docs all side by side right here. And actually Twitter has a very similar experience now that, now that I think about it. Uh, although Twitter is not a customer of ours, just to be sure. <clears throat> Uh, cool. So that's federated search. Uh, and then uh, I mentioned this briefly before. So you can also do multi tenant search. So uh, you can manage access at the level of an index or records within an index or even fields within an index. So, uh, so where this is helpful is let's say if, uh, you know, for example, uh, maybe once a user logs in, if you have certain roles where only the admin role can access all records and maybe the, I don't know, maybe the uh, uh, analyst role can only access a subset of these records, et cetera. You can create separate API keys for each of them. And within that API key, you can set access controls and say this API key can only access records with this value in these fields uh, as one example. And then let's say in another example, uh, if you have a, a use case where uh, you know, maybe some your your premium subscribers have access to all of the fields in your data set, and maybe your uh, uh, your free users only have access to a subset of fields uh, inside of your records. Uh, for filtering purposes, for example, you can create an API key that manages access that says these are, these are the only fields that are allowed in the uh, uh, in the search response as well. Embed it inside the API key, and then users can't override it. So it has a robust 
uh, and you can set API key uh, expressions, you can rotate API keys, et cetera. So all of this, we, it's a full blown authentication system that we built in service of, so that the biggest use case we're trying to enable here is so that you can directly send requests, authenticated requests, even for logged in users directly to TypeSense, instead of having to proxy it through your, uh, through your backend. And the reason you, uh, you would want to send it directly to TypeSense is because of performance reasons. So you can keep it super fast, uh, uh, even for the login use case uh, uh, search. Uh, this is uh, a question. Just, um, yep. um, I see a couple of questions. So first thing is, if if you look at an enterprise, enterprise will have their own uh, identity systems. Now, the, the problem there is that uh, while this makes it easier, they would probably not want to, uh, you know, recreate the entire uh, RBAC or access control uh, in another system. They would like to go for one from a single point of truth. Is is that a, a possibility in type sense in terms of integration? Uh, right. So the the way it, the integration works is so let's say when a user logs in, so the first thing that you would do is actually make at login time you would make a call out to your back end first look up all the you know rbc controls that you have mm -hmm. and then generate an api key using the type sense okay. client library okay. on the okay. back end and then send it to the front end so essentially you're not re-implementing things you're just mm -hmm. generating a new api key on every login with different okay, access understood. controls understood is it like basically the, the access control is still owned by the identity system is this type sense is mirroring it or in terms of uh, you know, in, enforcing it. Enforcing it, exactly. Yep. Yeah, That's it's right. not murdering, it's enforcing it. It's it's a bit, yep. bit like the OAuth paradigm of auth, resource authorization kind of concept. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, you could say you could you could draw that comparison. That's right, yep. Yeah, uh, okay. Then uh, the other question is when you say about multi-tenant, for example, if you talk about business units or uh, customer-facing units within the same organization, and let's say if a customer is interested in self-hosting type sense, which is, an enterprise with maybe regulations, can they have business unit specific uh, partitioning within the same type sense instance? Like you're kind of doing RBAC obviously, but we are doing it at a, instead of a user level, you're going it at a org or a uh, CFU level. Is that because yep. when you say multi-tenant uh, organizations, especially big organizations in terms of, you know, synergies will try to, use the same, maybe a bigger cluster, uh, a more powerful cluster, but separate across uh, business units within the same cluster. Right, so so you can do it in a couple of ways. I mean, if the organization is large enough, you might as well spin up you know, uh, uh, multiple Indeed, clusters yeah, at the hardware level. But let's say you have one large cluster that you want to put all the data. The first level of separation that you can do is create separate indices for mm -hmm. each business unit or set of indices Correct. for each business unit. Right. And then you can create API keys and say these API keys can only access these uh, mm -hmm. uh, indices uh, for every business unit. So that's that's one way to do it. Or let's mm -hmm. say for some reason, maybe some business units can access uh, uh, you know overlapping data, for example. In that case, you could put all of the data in one single collection and then create API keys that uh, that only allow access to particular records within maybe every record, for example, has uh, an array of field called, uh, you know, accessible to business units or something, right? And uh, mm -hmm. the API key can have an embedded filter inside it, which says this API key can only, only access records where business unit equals, you know, XYZ and ABC or ABC, for example. And then those API keys won't be able to access any of the other records, which have other values in the business uh, business unit field, essentially. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the explanation. Yep, yep. All right. So uh, moving on. Um, so does it scale? Let me present it. Oops. Oh, man. I didn't realize. Let's see. Okay, let me just keep it this. I'll keep it here. Okay. Uh, so does it scale? So of course the answer is going to be yes. Uh, so here are a couple of benchmarks that I wanted to share with you. Uh, so there's there was a recipes data set with about 2.2 million recipes uh, that someone published uh, uh, publicly. Uh, so indexing that in a 16 GB RAM 4 vCPU server, 
Uh, now the index itself only took about, I think one, one GB of uh, RAM usage, uh, but I wanted to make sure it's properly represented here. So the server itself had 16 GB, but the RAM size usage was one GB. Uh, it took about 3.6 minutes to index the 2.2 million records. Uh, and this node was able to sustain almost 104 searches per second uh, with an average search time of, of uh, 11 milliseconds. Um, and then uh, another data set with about 28 million uh, books, you know, titles, authors, categories, uh, again, indexed on the same machine, 16 GB RAM, 4 BCP. I think the actual RAM usage here was about 10 GB, if I remember correctly. Uh, so this took, for 28 million records, it took 78 minutes to uh, index all 28 million records. Uh, and then it was able to sustain a traffic of 46 searches per second uh, with an average search time of 28 uh, 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 milliseconds. Um, and then, like I mentioned, so we have, we run TypeSense ourselves at scale in TypeSense Cloud. It's been, it, you know, it's super useful for dog fooding, like any issues that crop up, we're able to quickly address them. Uh, and, you know, we serve 1 billion searches per month uh, uh, on TypeSense Cloud uh, as of this week, uh, and it's continuing to grow super fast as well. Uh, so let's talk about the ecosystem here. So of course, the biggest player uh, in the search space today is Elasticsearch. Uh, and the way, in fact, TypeSense came to be was because of Elasticsearch in the sense that, uh, you know, both Kishore and I have used Elasticsearch in the past, you know, deployed it at different companies. Um, and just the amount of trouble it takes to scale an Elasticsearch cluster as you keep adding more data. And this was at like fast growing startups that Kishore and I have worked at in the past. Uh, it would easily take, uh, you know, at least two engineers spending a couple of hours every other week trying to keep up with the growth of uh, growth of records, you know, trying to rebalance shards. And then sometimes the whole cluster will crash, we have to re-index everything. Um, and we were still paying a close to, I think at, that, at one point, we, at least in, in, in one of these use cases, several thousands of dollars uh, to run this Elasticsearch cluster, and it was still not stable enough. So all of that pain is what I would say kind of led us towards TypeSense is we were like, can we build something that's super easy to use uh, and doesn't have all these issues of running it in production? And the other big thing that we uh, did was, so Elasticsearch, has added a lot of search related use cases on top. So, you know, they do site and app search and they also do log search and they also do analytics. They also do visualization. They also do, uh, I think, security incident monitoring. They do uh, 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 aggregations, uh, like a whole suite of things, which is great because anything you can think of, Elasticsearch probably can do it. So it's full featured. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a super versatile tool, but, that's a blessing and a curse in that that all of because it's so versatile, the learning curve is incredibly steep. Uh, and I actually uh, grepped through the Elasticsearch code base and I found almost 3000 different configuration parameters to get Elasticsearch to do what you want it to do in under different scenarios. Again, you can look at it as that's awesome. You can configure so much out of Elasticsearch, but then on the other side, you also have to pour through hundreds of pages of documentation to figure out which of those 3000 configuration parameters you need to tweak to get it to work in your particular uh, uh, use case. So, um, and then it also has the dependency on the JVM because it's Java based and then it's built on Lucene. So essentially Elasticsearch adds uh, distribution on top of the core Lucene uh, uh, library. So on one side, when you deploy Elasticsearch to production, you, know, you have to tweak the JVM, which has its own set of configuration parameters, and then you have to tweak Elasticsearch's configuration parameters. So uh, all of this leads to high production overhead, you know, like, uh, you know, we've personally seen. Uh, 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 and that's one big thing that we've tried to solve, like, I mean, which is why, like I was saying earlier, it's a single binary, you deploy it to production, and you don't have to worry about other runtime dependencies on top, including, you don't even have to put a web server in front of it, because it comes built in with a, a web server. Um, and then in Elasticsearch, if you try to deploy a geo-distributed cluster, it is a non-trivial amount of uh, effort because it's not as well designed for high, uh, replicating data over high latency connections. Uh, 
And then if you wanted to do searching across multiple fields and you want to do typo tolerance and you want to do a prefix search, somehow this combination of things is super hard to pull off. Uh, uh, in or it's not trivial to pull off, I should say, is is uh, in Elasticsearch. You have, you have like, you know, construct a bunch of uh, additional indices and, and configure fields a certain way to, to get it to work this way. Um, and then in terms of API structure, uh, so the way the, the direction Elasticsearch has gone in is uh, they essentially have invented a, a, a DSL almost just for their query language. So kind of like how you learn SQL, you also have to learn Elasticsearch's DSL to be able to be an expert at Elasticsearch. And, uh, and this information is spread through probably like, you know, tens or 20 pages of documentation that before you can understand what's going on. Whereas in type sense, if you, in comparison, if you look at the API structure, essentially you say, you know, it's all RESTful and then you say, here's the query and then here's the fields and this is the priority order uh, in, in which you uh, uh, list it. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by Kibana query language. Is that the one you're talking about? Uh, no, actually, I wasn't even talking about that. I'm just talking about like the API structure that you send into Elasticsearch to do a simple search. Uh, like that is like essentially a, a kind of its own mini language that you have to learn. Uh, uh, I meant domain specific language. Like it's it's. Uh, not, I'm not talking about any of the other things that they have. It's just the API structure has gotten so complicated that it feels like a like another language that you have to learn. Um, and then there's another. AQL is an extended version, but actually internally, like Jason mentioned, it's a Lucene query format that they will use, which needs its own its own skills. It's not like a straightforward search. Am I right, Jason? Mm, I see. Okay, I'm not familiar with uh, KQL, so I, I can't speak to that. Uh, but if it's similar to SQL, then yeah, I, that's the similar concept that I meant. It's like just like how SQL has like strict rules on what what goes where, etc. Like there are very strict rules on how different sets of parameters work in, uh, in Elasticsearch. Um, cool, all right. So another big player in the market uh, is called Algolia. Uh, so uh, they are a proprietary hosted uh, SaaS search engine, uh, but they're very close in spirit to TypeSense and they are also an in-memory search engine uh, and they also all of these use cases that I was showing you, except for vector search, all of the other search use cases, uh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> all of the other use cases, uh, Algolia also supports, uh, but they've gone down the proprietary path and they are super expensive, especially in, in recent years. Uh, and on top of that, we've solved a lot of important limitations that Algolia has. So for example, in Algolia, if you wanted to, uh, add, let's say in an e-commerce setting, if you want, if you have sort by price ascending, descending, and then sort by, I don't know, product name ascending, descending, you have to duplicate your data four times if you have four, four sort orders. Whereas in TypeSense, you can have a single index and then you, you can sort on multiple fields without having to duplicate the data. Uh, and then if you want to run TypeSense in uh, CI, you can do that, whereas in Algolia, because it's SaaS proprietary and because it's expensive, you typically don't want to be running it in CI. Uh, and then in TypeSense Cloud, our billing model typically ends up saving almost 50 to 95% in costs uh, for an identical user experience when compared to, uh, to Algolia users. Uh, and then uh, now Algolia does have a very good UI library, like a search UI library where you can compose, you know, here's the search bar, here's the filter widget, you can compose it pretty easily. Uh, what we've done is we've essentially integrated with that library, which it's an open source uh, JavaScript library, and we've essentially integrated with it so you can keep the same widgets, but then send the queries to TypeSense uh, uh, instead of Alcolia. And then finally, the the where we're starting to diverge uh, uh, with Algolia is is the all the vector search features, and that's why you know more recently we've started calling ourselves. Uh, an open source alternative to Pinecone as well. Pinecone is another SaaS player uh, in the vector search field. Uh, and we're essentially, uh, the way Algolia is going about vector search, which I, they haven't revealed too much, too many details about it, uh, is they seem to be generating vectors internally using their own proprietary machine learning models. So they don't expose, uh, so you cannot bring your own machine learning models into Algolia. Whereas with TypeSense, we're saying, here's the underlying nuts and bolts, which is vector search. 
And then you can bring your own machine learning models on top and then do semantic search and, and, and recommendations and then hybrid search, uh, et cetera, together. So in TypeSense, we give you the choice to bring your own models. And that's a big thing that, that we're, where we're now starting to diverge from, uh, from Algolia. Um, and that's what TypeSense is so far. So essentially for you know, thinking long-term, one of the things that you know, one of our goals is to make sure that access to search as you type, you know, let's call it in-memory instant search engines, is available to as many people as possible, and that's you know that's one big reason we open sourced it in 2018. Uh, you know, we want TypeSense to be a part of every developer stack. If you think about search, hopefully we we want TypeSense to be uh, uh, be that thing, uh, just like how, for example, you know, Redis. You think of a data store, uh, a data structure server. Uh, uh, you know, Redis is typically part of a lot of developer stacks these days. And Elasticsearch seems to be that today. But then Elasticsearch has gotten very complicated over the years as they try to, you know, navigate. Uh, to, you know, trying to add more features to get more uh, uh, opportunity and go after new markets. They they're going after. You know, they become a super large uh, product, and we're trying to take one piece of Elasticsearch, make it opinionated and make it as widely accessible to as many people as possible while reducing the learning curve uh, uh, as well. So that's what we hope to achieve with, uh, with TypeSense in the, uh, uh, in the coming years. So we'd love to have you uh, join us as well and, and help contribute. So we're definitely not experts in every language out there. Uh, or every framework out there. So, you know, if there are languages or frameworks that you're familiar with, we definitely appreciate contributions for uh, client libraries and also framework integrations. Uh, uh, because so we, the, the way we look at the world is we're going to be experts in building the TypeSense core engine. And then we want to have a partner with others to then build on top of us so that, you know, we're an infrastructure layer and then others build, you know, uh, uh, integrations and, and platforms even on top of uh, uh, the core types. And so that's uh, that's how we look at the world. So uh, I, I look at it as we're building this together uh, uh, to bring types into more, uh, uh, to more folks. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Any questions? Uh, thank you for a very insightful session. So just as a um, background, how we reached out to Jason is, Jason had an interesting talk about uh, TypeSense a uh, few years before, if I'm not wrong, a developer submit. I happened to see that. And the moment I saw that as a long-term Elasticsearch user, I could relate all the pain point that Jason was mentioning about. So uh, if you consider search uh, in your company, probably TypeSense is one of the uh, must watch tool, whether you're using it or not, but first of all, you need to work. It's, it's worth watching it and you see the benefits. It really looked impressive. And after that, we reached out to Jason. Jason is from US, but uh, thank, uh, thanks to him uh, for coming. This is late night for him, but he accepted the call from us and then came all the way. And then what best when we learn about an open source project from the creator itself. Uh, that's a wonderful experience. And thanks Jason for that. And as Jason mentioned, we would like to contribute as a Java community. Uh, to the client libraries of Java, which we have already put forward to Jason. Uh, so Jason will come back to us uh, in case if he needs any Java later. In. And as a Java community, if you need anything, if you want to contribute, please do let us know, myself or Survey. We will be happy to add you as an open source contributor. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, uh, Satish and Shovik. Thank you for reaching out. This is this is great. Uh, and, and actually, that's a good point. So, I, so today, Kishore maintains our Java, our Java library, so I'm sure he'd appreciate it. Uh, you know all the help he can get. Uh, we uh, we get regular asks for adding different uh, uh, features, etc. So uh, you know if that's something that uh, that we can get additional help with, that'd be awesome. Yeah, the um, thing about our client library, some of them are com com completely community maintained. So uh, if you are like you know, uh, I know like, like a lot of people are looking to like dip their uh, feet into open source and. You want to maintain uh, a client uh, for a large community like TypeSense. If someone is interested, uh, please get in touch. Uh, um, because as the product evolves, uh, you know there's enough work to like keep going. Um, I had a couple of uh, uh, questions, Jason and Kishore. One yep. was that uh, you know uh, 
uh, let's say if somebody is willing to take type sense for a spin and on on a, on a local uh, machine like uh, say yes, not something very powerful but about 8 gb 16 gb are there public tutorials available for somebody who wants to take it for a spin reason for that is uh, getting something on uh, you know getting a cloud instance is uh, always a uh, what do you say uh, uh, it's a it's a, um, a dilemma between for the provider because uh, cloud instances are always you know having challenges of cost so yep yep yeah uh, for sure so yes i should have probably mentioned this in my talk as well but yeah so we have a bunch of different local installation options so you know if you're on a mac or we publish linux binaries docker container as well uh, or you can use docker compose you know debian packages rpm uh, on so we don't publish native windows uh, binaries just yet so you'll have to use docker or uh, if you use wsl windows subsystem for linux that's you can install the Debian package here as well. So it's all like, you know, uh, two or three commands and you'll be up and running. Okay. And, and what if anybody's interested in uh, looking at a uh, a cloud instance of TypeSense Cloud uh, and they are like, they're, they're trying to probably take it for a spin for say seven days and something of that sort, is that possible or no, that's too good? Uh, yes, so on the cloud, uh, version so the uh, the 0 0.5 GB or 512 MB mm. uh, pricing is free for the first 720 hours, which is about 30 days. Uh, okay. And so this is one. But then, well, one important thing is that we actually run the same binary that we publish open source in TypeSense Cloud. So it's actually identical from a API perspective. Uh, so from like a search perspective, all of it is identical. The things that we add on top of uh, 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 on top in TypeSense Cloud is essentially, uh, you know, point and click convenience. So, for example, if you want to turn on uh, high availability and do a multi-search uh, or multi-data uh, uh, center setup, you just flip that button. If you want to do a cross-region setup, you can turn that and select multiple regions right here. Uh, and then we have things like role-based access control for the admin dashboard. Uh, so, actually, let me show this quick. Uh, so you can create multiple teams uh, right here, and then you can create multiple clusters. So everything is point and click, and, and there's a UI where you can quickly uh, manage indices, manage the data. You can, there's a, a you know, search interface to look at the data, et cetera. So all of this is, like this UI is what you get in TypeSense Cloud. In addition to, of course, we manage the service for you. Uh, you don't have to worry about scaling. You, know, it's, you turn on automatic scaling, and then it'll automatically uh, upgrade as you reach the thresholds here. Uh, there's an interesting question from Sanjay. Uh, his yes. question is, uh, as, uh, off late, Redis also started providing search and Redis is also implemented in C uh, and it's, it uses RAM. So how type sense is compared to Redis in terms of performance and maintainability? Uh, so I haven't looked into it in too much detail, but at a high level, I would say the types of features that you need to pull off all of the use cases that I mentioned are not available in TypeSense, uh, sorry, in, uh, in, Red, in Redis search. So for example, uh, you know, I mean, I think they have vector search as well now, uh, but stuff like the grouping and faceting, like for example, in this demo that I was showing you, uh, to be able to power all of this and fuzzy search and sorting and pagination and, you know, facet value search, look, basically a combination of all of these to build a fully working uh, search solution, I don't think exists in Redis, uh, Redis search at the moment today. Uh, and I'm not sure if, if you've taken a look closely anything that you have. It's such uh, a feature of Redis, right? So uh, the, 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 so we are more like uh, heads down focused on search. So, um, so you will find a lot more nitty gritty uh, and all the nuts and bolts, uh, like, you know, we focus on with TypeSense. Uh, while Redis is more like you want to have, uh, you already have a data set on, uh, on Redis and you just want to enable searching, it's easier. So they they launched a feature for that, uh, but definitely they are not uh, very application focused. Like for example, like a lot of the examples that Jason spoke about are all very application and user specific focused, right? They are not, I don't see that from them, uh, but we have not like benchmarked them, um, uh, but uh, but that's the feel that we get when you go through their uh, when you go through their documentation and uh, their examples and so on. Yeah, one that I felt with Redis searches, uh, Redis search is basically kind of a plugin. It's basically Redis engine 
on top of that using redis engine they implemented such uh, because of that uh, it's like this if you have an existing redis environment then you want to have a little bit of search then it is an identical solution but if you are looking at search as an whole uh, different problem for your use case then use cases such i mean the solution such as typesense makes more sense because they started as a search engine they did not start as a uh, this one uh, a data store basically uh, uh jason kishore had one other question that for example let's say an enterprise like arsenal is interested in typesense so they are uh, probably using typesense cloud and um in case they have any specific uh, you know like hosting choices or anything else those are like i know those are, you don't have to probably answer them here but those are like the the flavors possible right of the cloud uh, i i didn't catch the last thing you said you said okay, so, so let's say let's say somebody is interested in using typesense and they are mm -hmm. on aws so for example they would prefer to use typesense as a managed service from aws compared to you know because of just for the reliability aspect or something so is that a possibility for an enterprise today uh so so typesense i mean i guess so we, you we can manage the infrastructure for you in typesense cloud uh unless you meant uh on uh, an on prem managed service like that's something that we don't do if you're self hosting it it's completely okay. on your infrastructure like we don't do a managed on prem uh, uh, solution at the moment if you use typesense cloud it's completely on our infrastructure uh and if someone wants to self host i mean we do have like support plans uh but that's more like consultative type support uh yeah. not for production level uh yeah. like, like production on call type support especially for on prem uh deployments it's only when we run the infrastructure in typesense cloud then of course that you're paying us for so we're on call for that and if if someone self hosts by the way it's completely free and like i said it's you have all of the search features 100% in the open source version because that's what we're running in types of cloud as well uh, uh and uh so search feature wise it should be it should be identical uh just a little uh, uh, question but uh, uh, if i'm an open source if i own an open source project and uh, how feasible it is to integrate type sense the reason being in elastic search what happened is after some time they made it as a, a proprietary license uh, which mm -hmm. which many of the open source project impacted so i just want to understand the uh, friendliness of that uh, 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 licensing model specifically for open source integration yep so so the license that we picked is gpl license uh, and it's the same license like the linux kernel uses so uh, we've taken inspiration from one of the most successful projects open source projects uh, and essentially if you do not modify typesense source code it does not the licensing does not even come into the picture you can run it yourself integrate it with a proprietary system or integrate it with you know an open source system it's all the same it's you're, you're running it as a binary or a container uh it, you know it doesn't gpl doesn't kick in at that point the only point where gpl kicks in or i shouldn't say the only point i'm not a lawyer the point when uh gpl kicks in is uh if you modify the source code and then you're distributing another version of typesense at that point gpl will kick in and say hey you also need to open source the modifications that you just did so that's the only thing and i believe uh, personally that uh, the gpl license actually helps open source thrive because if someone makes improvements to the typesense engine for example with most other licenses you can take an open source project make changes and then keep the changes closed source whereas with something like gpl you're forced to uh, uh uh open source it back into the community again so that helps the entire ecosystem thrive uh so that's that's why we chose you know gpl as as the license for uh for types and so uh that said so uh, i actually forgot what elastic such previous open license was um uh, uh, but, it was apache uh, apache that uh, lgpl2 actually and then oh, later I see. okay then they after seven uh, i think they changed it to ssl or something i'm i'm saying remember yeah that. sspl yep yep uh but yeah i mean so we're gpl we're happy with the gpl so uh yeah okay, okay. yeah you answered the question clearly yes so as a binary i can include it without any problem i can go correct uh, my my open source user also can take it and then deploy it without any problems that's what i said correct 
Yeah. Okay. Oh, speaking of uh, that use case, one interesting uh, use case that um, where should I show? Let's see. Uh, oh, so if you use any of these documentation site generators, like for example, this uh, this is DocuSar is one of the documentation sites. So you can use TypeSense here. In fact, we have a plugin uh, right here. So you can use TypeSense to power the search bar. So for example, this the DocuSar uses Algolia, uh, but you can use TypeSense to power an equivalent search experience uh, uh, as well. So there's like couple of uh, uh, notes here. In fact, that's what we use on TypeSense, uh, TypeSense documentation as well. Like all of this search is coming from uh, this framework called DocSearch. Uh, we've essentially forked DocSearch, which is another open source uh, project, and then made it work with, uh, with TypeSense. So, but UX wise, this is, we're using a slightly older UX on TypeSense docs, but even the newer UX is supported, which is like a modal view that comes in the center of the page. So that's also supported in uh, in Texas, I think. Yeah, so do you do ice creaming, Jason, that uh, TypeSense docs is powered by TypeSense? Uh, yes, <laughs> right here. Uh, this is powered by TypeSense, and I wanted to show you an actual example as well. So for example, this is one of some Microsoft's project, uh, open source, one of Microsoft's open source pro projects. So they use TypeSense right here. So if you, if you notice the UI is actually very similar to uh, the Algolia UI right here. Uh, but that's that's because it's a fork and then but instead of sending the queries to TypeSense, uh, sorry, instead of sending the queries to Algolia, it sends the queries to TypeSense. Right. We have a question for how is it to have make and manage open source project business? What's your experience and any gotchas to watch out for besides a good thing? Okay, great question. Uh, so I mean the so one of the ways we thought about, so we realized that, you know, open sourcing a project means that eventually we, at some point for this project to thrive, it has to have a sustainable business model backing it. Uh, and, you know, we didn't generate any revenue from this for the first, what, maybe like uh, five or six years, maybe. Uh, and the way we were able to sustain that is by working on this as a as a nights and weekends project, so we still had day jobs, and then uh, you know we'd come back home, spend our nights, and then good chunks of our weekends uh, uh, working on this over almost like five six years before we had a critical mass of uh, people who said, "Hey, we will we are ready to pay you." Uh, you know, and and enough traction to say, hey, this looks looks like it's going to take off. And if we don't spend dedicated time on this, we're going to miss an opportunity. Like we de-risk so much of the uh, the 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 business side of things before we jumped into it full time. So in general, that's something that I would uh, 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 recommend is if at any point you want to work on an open source project, or even if it's not an open source project, if you want to work on something full-time as a like a software business, is to de-risk it and not quit your job just yet. Like make sure you have at least a couple of paying customers before you jump into it uh, full-time. Like that's that's a, of course, it's going to take a long time before you're able, uh, you know, and a lot of effort because you're doing it on the nights and weekends uh, uh, to be able to do that. But I would say that gives you so much flexibility in the future because today, for example, uh, uh, you know, a big highlight of the way we run TypeSense is we're not VC backed. So we're completely funded by revenue from paying customers. Um, and that, even though, you know, we've had almost like 35 different VCs who reached out to us at this point wanting to invest in TypeSense, but we've consciously said no uh, to all of them for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, and we were able to do that because we have, you know, revenue to back us and, and we're growing pretty well. Uh, uh, and the fact that we were able to get uh, uh, revenue from customers also helps us focus just on the product rather than focusing on, you know, other external pressures from investors, for example. Uh, so that I would say helps, uh, helps us move even faster because we don't have additional distractions that typically other, uh, you know, venture back companies might have. So, uh, and for the long term, you know, we don't have to, 
raise prices, for example, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and make things crazy expensive like other venture back companies typically tend to do, uh, uh, et cetera. So anyway, I went off on a tangent there. But in uh, 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 in general, I would say uh, make sure that you have good traction before you work on something, you know, on an open source project full time, and you have a plan for how you're going to have paying users before you jump onto it. Uh, onto it full time. Otherwise, you, you'll have a ticking clock, which is, you know, when you run out of your savings or when you run out of funds, if you choose to raise funds, uh, which I would say uh, tends to limit uh, innovation in, the sen in, in a sense, because for us, because we were working on it as a side project, we essentially had zero deadlines. We had, you know, zero, you know, milestones. And we were like not saying, okay, by this time we have to do this. Is there, like nothing, like the only focus was, are we making progress, you know, week over week, month over month? Like that was the key thing that we focused on. Uh, and because of that, that gave us a lot of latitude to experiment with different things, see what sticks. And, and I, I feel like to be able to build a product over a long period of time, you need that level of flexibility, uh, especially something that's deeply technically involved. You need that level of, of uh, 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 flexibility. I didn't think of a correct word for that, but uh, uh, leeway maybe is the word uh, to be able to build something substantial. A bigger uh, boundary and, of things. I mean, so ah, exactly. So you can, yep, exactly. You can expand your, you know, I guess worldview and your boundary of, and not be constrained by things like, uh, you know, time and and, and your fin uh, finances. So uh, I would say that definitely helped us significantly with. With the things. classic uh, time scope and resource challenge, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you change? Uh, by yep, the way, yep. great question, uh, Yeshwant. Uh, just for everybody's reference, the question was, how was it to make an open source project and then host it as a business and any uh, Jason's experiences and challenges um, apart from you know figuring out a, a viable, sustainable license model? That's what the question was from Yeshwant. Great question. Anything else? Anybody? Um, the floor is open for Q&A. Uh, Kishore or Jason, if you'd like to share anything else with the community here. Yeah, let's see. I don't know, Kishore, any, any thoughts? Oh, yeah, maybe I can share this. So I, I hinted at this in the beginning, uh, is that we, before TypeSense, I think we probably worked on 13, maybe 12 or 13 different products uh, over more than a decade. All, uh, some of them, you know, got reasonable traction. Uh, and uh, I, I would say maybe like two or three of them got reasonable traction. And then TypeSense is, uh, is the one that made it really uh, big. And all of the other, what now, all, all the other 10 different products, didn't do so well, but still when we worked on each of them, I would say those were all a lot of learnings that we took with it and applied it as we worked on the next set of projects. So uh, I in so I guess the takeaway for that is, is I would encourage everyone to do like things on the side, uh, especially as you know, as software engineers, we we have that ability to just sit in front of a computer at, and you know, even at, at our homes and 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 just create uh, uh so if you have that uh uh yeah uh, I, I would say put it to good use like you know even if it's you're not building a business or you know plan to build a business in the you know eventually out of something i think it helps with learning new things like that's how we've always looked at side projects is is hey new technology comes out can we use build something interesting from it and that's how some of the products that eventually we built uh uh, uh uh, came came to life. So uh, keep playing around with new things as they come out, especially like now it seems like we're at the cusp of this whole large language model thing. Uh, I mean, build, into, you know, even if it's like toy things just for yourself, keep experimenting and, and build things on the side is something that I would, you know, I would generally say. And thanks for that view. It's really very interesting. Um, I, we had just one more uh, uh, announcement before we can close the session because it's about one and a half hours now and Jason's getting late for Jason. So 
we have a one day community conference uh, coming up uh, java fest on 15th of july uh it's for the community by the community of the community i know i'm repeating myself but uh, we have a larger audience right now so i just shared the details of registration as well as the conference page please uh, take a look and if you're interested reach out to the designated point of contacts um yeah that's it from us yeah and one important aspect we do lot of initiative for architecture smaller startup companies students and all those stuff but one we feel very close to our heart which is led by mr raghavan is we are trying to help people who lost their job because of recession uh, if if bangalore jack people are there they know about us few years before when pandemic hit we conducted special classes for six months continuously and that helped a few people uh, to restart their career which we even today find find proud of ourselves so we want to do the same thing now but this help is genuinely intended for those who lost their job because of the recession and they should have been in a java community if you know anybody please look at our site give the reference to them we will be happy to help them thank you sudesh um anything else uh, anyone otherwise we can call it a day thank you again for joining on a saturday morning thanks jason thanks awesome. thank you